Um, so yes, I was an environmental writer for a long time. I was an activist for a long time. Um, uh, for a long time, I saw my words as a, as a campaigning tool. Um, I then hit a wall with that around 2008, 2009, when I looked at the realities of what was happening with climate change and started to believe that we couldn't stop it and turn it around, which I still believe, and believed that the momentum of the society that we've built is going to really hit the wall um, and take a lot of the natural world with it. So I thought, well, what does that mean for me? So what does it mean and what kind of art would you create? Would you create any? What's the meaning of that? And that was the question behind the Dark Mountain Project, which I started in 2009, which was originally intended to be quite a small writers group um, and turned into uh, a, a very big global network of many thousands of writers and artists which still exist today. Um, we publish several books a year, we run festivals and events and all kinds of other things and they all delve into this question. What are the stories we're telling ourselves now? What stories should we be telling ourselves about our relationship with the rest of the world and what kind of art, what kind of creative endeavor should we be engaging in if we were really taking this seriously? We live in what is easily the most ecologically destructive culture in human history, but how did we get here? Have humans always been hardwired for ecocide, or did things go wrong somewhere along the journey? Was there an event or a series of events in our history that led us to the point where we regarded ourselves as separate from something external called nature, which we could choose either to idealize for pleasure or ravage for profit? And if so, can we identify and learn from them? The notion that humankind has experienced a fall, a point at which we were rejected from a garden, runs like a golden thread throughout Western culture. In his novel Ishmael, Daniel Quinn suggests that the biblical story of the fall is a dim historical memory, a retelling through myth of the human development of agriculture. The Garden of Eden represents the prehistoric world of the hunter-gatherer tribes who were displaced by agriculturalists. The development of agriculture, far from being a leap forward, was in this reading a disaster. People were forced to leave a world in which wild creatures were abundant, hunting was relatively easy, and edible food was widespread, for back-breaking toil in the fields, a shorter and less healthy life, and a constant battle to subdue nature with plows and walls and fences and flocks. Perhaps then the development of agriculture, which is the basis for all modern civilizations, was the point at which we began to look at the non-human world as a collection of potential resources to be utilized. Certainly it was the development of agriculture and the settled communities, towns and eventually cities that resulted that allowed us to create the hierarchical, technologically dependent civilization that today is denuding the planet of its riches. Perhaps, on the other hand, the problem isn't agriculture but industry. Until the Industrial Revolution really got off the ground in the 18th century, the Earth's human population was small and relatively limited in the damage it could do. Then we discovered and began to extract and burn coal, gas and oil, and the party really began. It could be that the climate change that this most, most recent of technological leaps has already set in motion will knock the human experiment with civilization on the head altogether. Then again, perhaps the problem goes back further than this. Perhaps the taming of fire by human beings was the point at which we separated ourselves from other creatures. Perhaps it was the making of tools which allowed us to hunt and kill, way beyond the level that might be considered natural. The novelist William Golding believed that the development of language itself represented a symbolic break in human evolution. Language, he suggested, allowed us to overlay abstractions onto reality and begin to shift away from that reality into our self-created internal universe. In reality, there was probably no one moment before which we lived in harmony and after which a covenant was broken. Instead, there is a historical arc that can be traced from the development of human language to the development of synthetic bees. If there is, in the words of Thor Heyerdahl, nothing for modern man to return to, the question is what we can move on to and how we can do it in a way that brings us back in tune with what the philosopher Thomas Berry called the great conversation between humans and the rest of the natural world. So that um, brief introduction um, gets, to, gets to the question that increasingly interests me, perhaps out of all the, the writing I've done, that it keeps circling back around to this notion of a great conversation between humans and the rest of nature. Thomas Berry, who was a theologian as well as an ecologist, um, also had another lovely quote. He said, the universe is a communion of subjects and not a collection of objects, which is rather nice. Um, and I wonder um, what it means in the modern world when we believe that there is something out there called nature that's separate from us, 
what it means if we want to start paying attention to it again, and how it would look to us all if we believed that we were still animals in a living world. Um, and I started the essay with a story of when I was in West Papua in Indonesia many years ago, and I was walking through the forest with the tribal people there, and they, they were taking me from one village to another. And at one point they just stopped and they looked through a break in the trees and they just sang a song to the forest in their own language. And, and then they walked on and it wasn't anything they did to impress me. I didn't know what it meant until I asked them later. And they said, well, it's just a song of thanks. It's what we do. We thank the forest as we part through. It's just an exchange um, because we live here. It's just part of the land we're in. And we sing to the forest and the forest sings to us. And it was very matter of fact. And I thought there's something there that I'm entirely missing in, in the culture that I'm in. The notion that you can speak to the forest and the forest speaks to you and whatever that means to you. Um, and I wondered as writers what would happen if we believed that was possible. What kind of work would we, would we produce? So just a short extract from that, from this essay, which is called Singing to the Forest. The notion that the non-human world is largely inanimate is often represented as scientific or rational, but it's really more like a modern superstition. It is just like man's vanity and impertinence, wrote Mark Twain, to call an animal dumb because it's dumb to his dull perceptions. We might say the same about a forest, and science, interestingly, might turn out to be on our side. In recent years, several studies have demonstrated that plants, for example, communicate with each other in ways that seem to point towards some degree of self-awareness. The supposedly secular West still clings to the Abrahamic notion that only humans possess consciousness or souls, and that this gives us the right or the duty to run the world. The, science, the scientists investigating animal and plant consciousness, though, may be taking us back to older ways of seeing by very modern means. Primitive savages who sing songs to the forest may not be primitive or savage after all. They may simply have retained an understanding that human-centred urban people have forgotten, that the forest is indeed alive, and not only the forest, the living world around us may turn out to be much more sentient, aware, conscious and connected than we have allowed ourselves to believe. As a writer, I wonder what our writing would look like if we took this notion seriously. I wonder in particular what our fiction, what our stories would look like. That the world is a machine is one story, that the world is alive and aware is another. The latter story has probably been taken for granted by the majority of human societies throughout history. The former has really only taken root in ours, post-enlightenment industrial Western culture now becoming global culture. The results of it, climate change, mass extinction, factory farming, the usual litany of horrors, should be enough to make us wonder if this story is badly constructed, badly told, or just plain wrong. Robert Graves, in his poetic manifesto, The White Goddess, wrote that modern poetry's function was to lay bare the results of humanity's break from the rest of nature. He wrote, once a warning to man that he must keep in harmony with the family of living creatures amongst which he was born, it is now a reminder that he has disregarded the warning, turned the house upside down by capricious experiments in science, philosophy and industry, and brought ruin upon himself and his family. If this is true of poetry, it's true of fiction too. What might the alternative look like? Perhaps the poets can see this better than the novelists. Robinson Jeffers, poet of the California Cliffs, spent his life trying to transcribe the song of the living world and make it fit for human ears. He ends his poem Carmel Point with this prescription. We must uncenter our minds from ourselves. We must unhumanize our views a little and become confident as the rock and ocean that we were made from. I'm touching towards the end there on a, on a notion that was central to the manifesto of the Dark Mountain project that we wrote in 2009, which we called Uncivilization. Because if you're going to write a manifesto, you've got to have a grand title. Um, you've got to get someone's attention. Um, but at the center of it is this notion, which I touched upon there, that um, all societies and all people tell stories to get them through the night and through the day. There's a quote from Ursula Le Guin. She says, um, there have been great civilizations that did not use the wheel, but there have been no civilizations that did not tell stories. The humans are storytelling animals and we cr construct these narratives about who we are. Um, and so one of these stories we tell ourselves is that we're separate from, from something called nature, which is out there, which we can control and manage in some way. Um, we tell ourselves a great grand story of progress, 
that humanity began sort of grunting in the swamps and ends up conquering the stars. And there's a kind of linear progression there. Life is a line rather than a circle. We tell ourselves stories that our, our cleverness and our technology will be able to get us out of anything that we've got ourselves into, um, which is a notion that the historian Ronald Wright calls the progress trap, by the way. Uh, he he uh, wrote a lovely little book called A Short History of Progress, which I recommend reading. It's very good. It unravels this whole, this whole story of progress. Um, we touched on agriculture earlier, the notion that agriculture is a leap forward turns out not to be true when you examine the bones of agriculturalists and compare them to the bones of hunter-gatherers who turn out to be much taller and longer lived and healthier than agriculturalists were for centuries. Yeah, just to come back again and ag uh, again to this question of what ties these books and this writing together is this constant s anxious search for the, the heart of the living world, for this notion that we have built ourselves a bubble. One of the things we talk about in the Dark Mountain Manifesto, which is in the back of the book of essays, is the notion that civilization is a bubble, that we have managed to build ourselves a probably quite temporary um, thing, concrete and steel and plastic edifice in which we can live, and we can have relationships only with other human beings, and we can pretend that that's what a conversation is, that it's the only one that we need. But outside it is everything else. Outside it are all the trees and the beetles and the bacteria and everything else. And we've pushed that so far now, we've pushed that relationship so far that it's breaking and all the tendrils are coming into our civilization. And so we're going to be forced somehow over the next few years or decades or centuries to start that great conversation again with the rest of the world. Um, and so increasingly, to me, that seems like something that writers can usefully do and that we can all usefully do. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm.